Welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Rebecca Thoman and I direct Compassion and Choices Doctors for Dignity Initiative. We're a community of physicians from across the country in support of a full range of end of life options. Today's webinar is a deep dive into the topic of VSED, Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking. Thanks for joining us. Just a few webinar reminders. You are muted and your video is off. Um, you can submit questions via the Q&A box or via the chat. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website possibly as early as tomorrow. For those of you who don't know our organization, Compassion and Choices is the country's largest nonprofit organization committed to improving care, expanding choice, and empowering everyone to chart their end of life journey. We provide end of life planning resources, including a dementia specific planning tool. We advocate for legislation to authorize medical aid in dying. And we work to address end of life disparities so that everyone has access to care and comfort at the end of life. You can read more about us on our website, compassionandchoices.org. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Timothy Quill. Tim is Professor Emeritus of Medicine, Psychiatry, Medical Humanities, and Nursing at the University of Rochester Medical Center. He's a palliative care physician, author, educator, scholar, and advocate. He was the founding director of URMC's palliative care program and is past president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Dr. Quill was the lead physician plaintiff in the New York legal case challenging the law prohibiting physician-assisted death heard in 1997 by the US Supreme Court. That case is known as Vaco v. Quill. Dr. Quill is gonna be discussing his new book that he co-edited called Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking, a compassionate, widely available option for hastening death. Um, it is available at Oxford University Press, also on Amazon and Google Books. And I've heard uh, Tim told me that the first print is has been uh, been bought up, but they've done a second printing, and I'm hoping after tonight they'll do a third printing. Um, so in it, his co-authors uh, cover the legal, clinical, ethical, and practical issues surrounding VSED as an end-of-life option. And in this webinar, we're going to be focusing specifically on VSED in the context of dementia. So before we start, I just wanted to do a little bit of information to get us all on the same page. So Dementia is really a set of symptoms that occur as a result of brain cell degeneration and affects multiple functions, including memory, thinking, and social abilities. About one out of three seniors in the US will die with some form of dementia, although it may not be the primary cause of death. And of course, this month is Alzheimer's Disease Awareness Month. And a few facts from the Alzheimer's Association is that Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's the sixth leading cause of death in people over 65. On average, people live about eight to 10 years after the diagnosis is made. And of course, Alzheimer's is a progressive disease. There's no cure, although there are some drugs to treat symptoms and to slow the progression. And the risk factors for Alzheimer's are age, family history, and lifestyle. And lifestyle meaning, um, weight, control of your weight, smoking, the, uh, nutrition, the things that basically lead to a healthy lifestyle. And it's important to note that African-Americans are twice as likely to be diagnosed with dementia and Hispanics at 1.5. And I believe that that does have to do with the lifestyle factors um, and social determinants where housing, nutrition, safety, education, and injustice contributes to those variations in health status. So I'd also just like to take a few minutes to go through the stages of Alzheimer's as we're talking about um, the progression of the disease, just so people are kind of all on the same page. So normal decline, this is something I have, a lot of us have, sort of basic word loss, especially names, uh, misplacing objects like your keys and eyeglasses. This is normal decline and it does not impair the functioning and obvious, it's not obvious to others. And a lot of us have this um, normal decline. But in the early stages of Alzheimer's, people start developing more significant word finding problems that become noticeable to others, having difficulty with reading retention, 
uh, misplacing valuable objects, concentration problems. And as that progresses to the mild stage, there is some decreased memory then for recent events. There may be challenges doing challenging math, mathematics, so not simple math, but something that might be more challenging. Reduced ability to plan for things such as shopping for groceries or cooking a meal and the beginning to start become withdrawn in social settings. The moderate stage, there are more memory gaps for details, uh, time confusion, struggle with simple mathematical skills, and now needing help with planning, such as cooking clothes, I'm sorry, choosing clothes or cooking meals. Uh, as the disease progresses, people begin to lose awareness of recent experiences, start to begin to forget their personal history, they may need help with daily activities like dressing or toileting. They have sleep disruptions, may experience wandering and start to have personality changes. Um, and then of course, in the severe stage, they start to lose awareness of surroundings entirely. They may lose recognizable speech, be regularly incontinent and lose the ability to walk, sit upright or even swallow. And I also wanted to point out, many of you probably are uh, familiar with Barbara Coombs Lee book, Finish Strong. Uh, chapter eight in that book talks a lot about dementia and is uh, even more specific. If you're interested in reading more about the disease and how it progresses, I definitely recommend uh, Barbara's book, Finish Strong. So before we get started, I also wanted to just do a few definitions to be sure we're all on the same page. And so I took this definition right out of Tim's book. V said is the process whereby a person with current or prospective serious illness chooses to completely stop eating any food or drinking any fluids with the intention of hastening their own death. Because so many of you know about our work on medical aid in dying, I, I specifically want to call this out and demonstrate that this is a different, very different thing. So medical aid in dying is a specific clinical practice in which a terminally ill adult of sound mind may ask for and receive a prescription medication they can self-administer for a peaceful death if and when they decide their suffering is unbearable. And the key phrase here really is sound mind. Um, medical aid in dying is not available to people with a dementia diagnosis. And that's because in the criteria, you must have a six month prognosis in order to qualify for medical aid in dying. And people with dementia, by the time they've reached a six month prognosis, most have lost the capacity. So that is the challenge. Um, and that, with that, we're gonna launch into our interview with Tim. Welcome, Tim. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank um, you. I'm have, glad to be here. We have a lot of people here this evening, and I think it really demonstrates that people are hungry for information about VSED. A lot of people are concerned about facing dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And so as we let's just start by kind of laying the ground work, groundwork and tell us, explain to us about the VSED experience. What is that really like for patients? Well, there's several phases to it. Uh, there might be a contemplative phase where you're thinking about your options. You want to know whether uh, you're face, you might be facing a serious illness, might be have some early signs of dementia. And you might be thinking down the road, I don't want to go to the later uh, phases of this. So uh, you may start to think about this and begin to explore with the, your family, with uh, the clinicians you work with about what are my options if if I if I decide at some point that that I don't want to go further with this that it's getting too close uh, to to a dementia diagnosis could also be done around other diagnoses but dementia would, I think would be a particularly common one and a particularly frightening one uh, the catch twenty two with dementia is that if you wait too long you know you may lose the capacity to make this type of a decision and that that's a that's a, a troubling, uh, worrisome piece of dementia as a diagnosis. So how would you describe the VSET experience? I, I think that um, people with late stage cancer, for example, um, may to choose to stop eating and drinking, but just what is the experience of VSED like for the patient? What happens when they decide to stop eating and drinking? 
So the the um, so that you've made it, you've thought about it for a while. You've now made a decision. It's time to start. And and uh, you know the first thing you notice is that hunger disappears quite quickly. So if you don't eat, many of you may have had the flu or maybe you've done some fasting for religious reasons or spiritual reasons, you get ketotic pretty quickly if you don't eat. Your body generates ketones and ketones take away your appetite. So not eating is relatively easy and straightforward. The not drinking part is much more difficult because when you really don't drink, you get very thirsty, your mouth gets dry, uh, you, you begin to get weaker and, and the drive to have something to uh, wet your whistle to drink, it gets to be pretty strong. So there are techniques to get around this. You can put artificial saliva or other kinds of liquids in your mouth and then spit them out. But if you actually sip and sip and sip for comfort, uh, the process of VSED can go on a very long time. And so that's, that's a challenging part about it. So the not drinking is tough. The not eating part is relatively easy. Uh, but the hardest part is making up the decision that this is the time. Uh, and when you made that decision, most people who've really made it are very motivated by the time they, they do it. And that really helps make, make the process successful. If people are diligent about it, um, how long does the process actually take? Uh, it depends a little on how uh, sick you were, uh, how debilitated you were going into it. So if you were pretty uh, uh, frail and um, uh, you know, had already gotten well, maybe lost a lot of weight and uh, then, then it might go in the order of 10 days to two weeks. So 10 days, maybe even a little shorter if you were really frail going into it. But the most common time frame would be 10 days to two weeks. Could be longer, particularly if you if you're not quite as diligent around the fluids, and it could be shorter because as people get sicker, other things can happen. They can get infections. They can have arrhythmias. Other other kinds of things. So ten to fourteen days would be the the most common, and that's provided that you're really diligent about not drinking. And so, how do people typically die when they undertake these? Said, well they get uh, dehydrated. So they get weaker. Uh, they, uh, you know, they may, when they start out, still be independent, be able to walk around, uh, you know, do, th do a few things. But as you uh, get more dehydrated, you're getting weaker. So you're going to then be much more restricted, perhaps to a chair or one room, uh, then to a bed uh, and, and not be able to get out of bed safely because your blood pressure is going to start to go low. So you need to have people around you to help take care of you. And then, and then as you get even more weak, uh, you're going to maybe uh, need help with just about everything. And you also may get a little more confused, more sleepy, uh, more withdrawn. And, and again, when it goes smoothly, that's just a linear process. It's very similar to normal dying, actually, because that's what happens in people who, who can't eat and drink at the end of life because they're too sick. Uh, they get weak just like that and get, get more bed bound and eventually more withdrawn. And then uh, a big, most people will get very sleepy and less responsive before they die. And uh, is there um, support the healthcare team can give to make it an easier process? Or is this something that is done just by families? No, I think, well, the, the challenge with uh, uh, the, the usual uh, health uh, system that we get involved as people are nearing death would be hospice care. And hospice care does provide more and better care at home than ordinary home care. Uh, so again, depending on your diagnosis going into VSED, you might be uh, not terminally ill enough to qualify for hospice at the start. So you have to be more likely than not to die in the next six months to qualify for hospice. Now, once the VSED process has started, uh, then uh, you, you're getting weaker. And most people would then say you qualify for hospice. Now, hospices may vary a little bit around their views about VSED. So some hospices are very uh, see this as a variant of normal dying and are very supportive of it. Others are a little more hesitant because this is, in a, in a certain way, a self-willed process, and, and that's, that goes across boundaries for some people and some organizations. So um, 
just to clarify, so if you're, let's say you have a terminal illness, you're already in hospice, you're likely to, that the hospice will likely support your effort if you decide to stop eating and drinking. The challenge is if you're not terminally ill and already enrolled in hospice. That's yes. If you're not terminally ill and you're not already enrolled, if you're already enrolled in, in hospice, you know, if you take a look at how people die in hospice, they often, the final common pathway is often dehydration, right? Because people as they're dying, stop eating and drinking quite naturally. They can't eat and drink anymore, really. Uh, and, and, and hospices are very comfortable with that. That's a normal part of dying. And, and there's probably in, the, in that process, some people get tired of dying who are on hospice and probably just lose interest. They, they just say, I'm ready. I, don't, I, I can see this is prolonging it and I wanna speed it up a little bit. I think most hospices will not look too carefully at that and just accept that as a normal variant of hospice. But the more you are not with a clearly defined terminal illness going into it, uh, the, the, the more hospice is gonna have a little hard time from a prognosis point of view. So you have to be more likely than not to die. And if, if the diagnosis is early dementia, you don't have that six month prognosis. So you, now you might have that prognosis when you're well into the process of stopping and drinking. And again, some hospices would then accept you on, others might be more uncomfortable with it. So just to, I, I think I heard you and I'm just gonna say it again to clarify that if, if I'm hearing you correctly in the audiences. So um, if you're not terminally ill, it's unlikely that any hospice would admit you to, to actually begin the process of VSED. But if you started the process of VSED, let's say you're early in dementia, there reaches a point in that process where you might be able to get hospice support when it's clear that you are now going to die. Yeah. And okay. Uh, I, I, my, my recommendation would be though, if you were thinking about VSED in this circumstance where you didn't have a clearly defined terminal illness, it would be very reasonable to contact your local hospice, be very straightforward about what you're gonna do and say, look, we uh, wanna make sure I can get as much support as I can in this process. And once either from the beginning, some hospices would probably take you on from the beginning. I think if they kind of understood this and accepted it, others might, uh, take you on once you've started the process and we're days into it, several days into it. And others also might just say, this is beyond what we feel comfortable with. In which case, then you'd have to go to a other care system, family, uh, you know, other caregivers out in the community, which you can often find to help support these things. A few questions are popping up in the chat that I'm seeing as we're talking about, is there are people ex who ex go through the VSED process in pain? Would morphine be something that would be helpful to them? And what might the family do to help relieve the suffering? So, it, you know, there's not, VSED itself is probably not a painful uh, process. You know, the, you may have a pain as part of your condition. And if you were in the, nearing the end stage of that condition, you'd wanna have that pain aggressively managed. And I think most palliative care clinicians and hospice clinicians would have no problem being very aggressive about pain management, shortness of breath management, delirium management, because that's very familiar terrain uh, to them. And, and I think if once you've reached a point that, you, that people accept that you are dying, they'll be very aggressive about that, I think. Uh, if, if people are more conflicted about the actual process, then I think it's a little bit more problematic. It's, it's good to have, to find a medical partner who would go with you in this process, even if perhaps it wasn't a hospice program. So it might be a primary care uh, clinician. It might be a, a clinician who's an expert at the prim your primary diagnosis, if it's heart failure or, or uh, uh, you know, cancer. Those, those clinicians might have an open mind about this and having a medical partner is really a, an important piece of the puzzle because there will, if, if delirium comes up, if pain does become a part of it, you want somebody who's at the ready to keep you comfortable and, and that should be very doable, but you need, you need a prescriber to do that. You really emphasize in the book that this is not easy and that people really need to, the best situation is to have a supportive healthcare team to help you through this? Very definitely. This is not, it's, I mean, it's not, it's, 
there are things that are harder, you know, it's so, so it's not the hardest thing in the world, but the not drinking is very hard. The a lot of the people who do this, by the way, are really self-disciplined, often some might say controlling people, self-controlled people. Uh, that's a good quality if you're going to do something like this, because you know why you're doing it. You know, you're doing this for a reason to achieve a goal that you're trying to achieve. And, and having your yourself on board, the clinician you're working with, and also uh, uh, having your immediate family on board. You don't have to have everybody in the extended family know all the details about this, but the core group of family who are going to be a part of this, they have to have talked it through and thought it through with you because you don't want to have them tempting you with, you know, why don't you want it? Wouldn't you like this ice cream float, you know, as you're trying to, to stop eating and drinking? You want people who are going to be supportive. You want to have them get knowledgeable about they can help you sip and spit out so you relieve the dryness by sipping, but spitting out so you don't prolong the process. And there are some techniques that are learnable uh, very readily uh, if you if you understand what you're trying to do. Um, I'd like to shift to talking a little bit more about dementia, but before we do that, um, there is a, and I know you're not a lawyer, but Thaddeus Pope is, and he wrote some of the sections on the legal aspects of VSED, but it sounds to me like from the book that VSED is legal everywhere in the US. It's, it's been considered settled law and equivalent to your right to withdraw life-sustaining treatment. How would you describe that legality of VSED, just yeah. in general? <laughs> So uh, let me preface that by saying I am not a lawyer. So this, this uh, advice may not be uh, something you want to take to the bank. Uh, but, but I think uh, the, the most honest way to say it is that it's not illegal. So there aren't laws prohibiting you from doing this. There aren't a lot of affirmative laws that say that this is permissible. So a lot of times it really hasn't been fully tested in, in the legal system. But I think, I think it's so close to, to the natural part of dying that I think most people think that it doesn't have to occur, that we don't need to create laws around this. Uh, and that, and that the, 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 the other thing, if you think about, if you're taking somebody who's, you know, how would you counter this if you were trying to stop somebody from doing this, who's, who, who is making a clear decision they want to do it? you would do it by force feeding and forcing fluids. And, and there's something very unsettling and abhorrent about doing that to someone who's this sick, who's made, made a decision around the end of their life that's, that's, that's about their own view of dignity and meaning and readiness for death. So I think, I think those, uh, th that fact has really helped this be more or less accepted. And, Maybe doesn't need. Maybe we don't need to have huge amount of laws because once you once you start getting the legal system involved in the details of this, that can create other problems. So I guess I would say I'm also wondering about there are laws against assisted suicide and there are laws against elder abuse. Are you aware of any situations where those laws have come into play in a VSED situation? Uh, and I've not been aware of any cases that have gone to court and been lost. And, and, and I think the questions about this have been thought about, uh, again, and uh, uh, the elder abuse part of it rides very heavily on this being a patient-driven decision. So getting clear documentation, articulation, some people even do uh, uh, video interviews of a patient talking about why he or she wants to undertake this. So there's really some solid evidence uh, that this is their own uh, unique uh, decision. And, and, and then when you look at what you have to do to get around this is really force feeding. And, and there's, there's something about that that just doesn't settle uh, for most people uh, if somebody is really making an, an informed decision about this, particularly if they're seriously ill, thought it through, documented what they're doing. Uh, and have a, and have and their families on board, you know. So those are all some of the ingredients. Not all, you know. Not everybody comes from a perfect family, so maybe not everybody in your extended family has to know about this. But the core people in your in your group 
uh, need to be on board and have thought it through with you. Great. So we've been talking just generally about VSED kind of in any situation. And I want to switch to talking specifically about it in the case of dementia. And in the book, you do a very nice job of separating out VSED in cases of dementia in the earlier stages when patients still have capacity versus what we're, it's really said by AD or stopping eating and drinking by advanced directive, because you're at the point now where the person has lost capacity, they're not initiating this willfully, but they've put it in their advanced directive that when they get to a certain stage, they would like all eating and drinking to stop. So let's start with the first one and talk about people who might undertake this at, a, at an earlier stage. The first question I have is kind of how do you determine whether somebody with Alzheimer's and dementia, at what stage do you consider that they still have their executive capacity intact? And at what, and what do you look for to determine that maybe they don't? How do we know when they are making a rational decision still? Yeah, I think I think the the inter interviewing the patient is is probably the best way to do this. And you really want to make sure that they are able to think this through, understand the consequences of what the action is, that they're able to sustain these thoughts so that it's not just one moment in time, but it's over time. Uh, so this is done through conversation. And, and uh, again, if you were if if it was ambiguous, you would want maybe having more than one person interview the patient, uh, you know, and, and if it was really getting toward more advanced stages, you might want to think about having somebody who has expertise in dementia uh, think about this. Now, if, again, if you think about it, people with early dementia make a lot of end of life decisions, right? They make a decision because they have dementia, they're going to either not go on to life supports or stop them potentially. So we we make decisions with people who have early stage dementia all the time, but if they're big life and death decisions, sometimes we may get more than one set of eye, clinical eyes to look at them. Medical, palliative care, uh, psychiatric might, might all look at that patient and say, is, is this really uh, something that this person is able to think through enough to, to make a major life and death decision? Um one of the points that you make in the book is that even for people who are at the earlier stages and are deciding they're going to undertake VSED because they want to be in charge and they don't want that, to, you know, basically, if you don't do it early, if you wait to the later stages, you're really depending on somebody else to fulfill this um, request. And so if you want to do it at the early stages in the, your book, you say people should still be really specific and write an advanced directive almost as if they were going to do it at a later stage because of the loss of capacity during the process of VSED. So at some point they may become delus delus delusional or lose capacity. Um, what, how do you approach that with people who are taking this on early in a dementia diagnosis? Well, first of all, this, this same, uh question or dilemma should be also for people who are choosing VSED for reasons other than dementia, right? Because they too may lose capacity in the late stages as people get dehydrated and their electrolytes get out of whack. They may become uh, delirious and confused and you wanna have documentation that this is really the patient's wishes and what does the patient want if they lose capacity in the future? They want you to continue the process. So the more you have that clearly delineated uh, in some kind of a document, the, the solider, the more solid the ground is uh, that you're going to be able to carry through this process, both ethically and clinically. And again, I think it's even, even more important for somebody with early dementia really trying to document this out as best you can. Uh, now, again, uh, and, and I think it works pretty well, the, this kind of a documentation, provided the patient isn't like really wanting something to drink, you know, so that, you know, as they lose capacity. So what, what if they're, you know, they've said this, they've said it all out, but they, you know, they see water anywhere, anywhere in the room and they're, you know, want it. Right. Uh, and so, so, you know, did they change their mind or, or is this uh, just confusion talking? And I think these are, these are really uh, dilemmas that, that a clearly stated advanced directive would really help with, 
uh, but they're also, you may have to, if they're really adamant about drinking, you may have to come up with some kind of backup uh, solution. And again, the, the main backup solution for this would be uh, what, what, what we've called minimal comfort feeding, comfort drinking only. So you basically give the minimum amount that provides them some relief without any, without any uh, notion that it's going to be adequate hydration or nutrition. So again, that's, that, that would be a backup plan if, if a person really seemed like they were changing their minds, even though they were very confused. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about, you know, in the best of circumstances, the family's on board, They've talked about it, things have been written down, but you start the process and it's still not easy for the family. Can you talk a little bit about what happens, how the, what the experiences are for the family as they go through the visa process? Well, it's, it's I would say it, there's a lot of variation, uh, you know, as people get closer to the patient's death, more people get anxious about those things as they would with any family dynamic of normal dying. And then, and now when it's a willful normal dying, you know, in a certain way, uh, that may create more conflict. So again, the, the more these things are talked through upfront, uh, the better. So, so the more people not only make sure they're on board, but if somebody's not on board, you kind of come to grips with that. What are we going to do if they start to push the process? And how do you want us to, so you could talk with a patient about that. You know, you have a, you have a sibling who's adamantly opposed to this. How should we handle that if, if he or she starts to try to undermine this, the later stages of this process? And again, if you have words from the patient, say, please don't listen to, to can't, we'll call it him, because he really, he'd be responding to his own needs, not mine. And I really don't want you to. So if I had a clear statement from the patient like that, that would be very helpful for me to explain why I'm not listening to this sibling who is saying something different. And again, the more you can think through those hypotheticals up front, uh, anything, anytime you, you know, in, in my experience in palliative care, anytime a person doesn't have capacity, but we can, I can with family, remember a statement that they made that really fits to this dilemma, the more we feel like we're on solid ground. And you know, the, the, this is most important for families because they have to, after the patient is, has died, we don't want them to be haunted by these statements. We want them to be able to say, you know, she really was clear about this. And she said this, that made us feel comfortable that she did know what she was getting into. So let's, let's shift to some of the challenges that that someone might experience in a later stage of dementia. They have written in their health directive that at a certain point, they no longer want to be, have any food or liquids. Um, is, is that legally enforceable? That's one question. Is this, you know, how does it work with an advanced directive that's requesting stopping eating and drinking? What are the laws around that? Well, I, I, again, uh, I, will, I will preface this by saying I'm not a lawyer, so uh, right. I'm not sure, but, but I don't think, uh, I think, I think the laws would say, the, the laws don't, the legal system doesn't really want us to get in and start parsing that out uh, for people. So I think if, if there have been statements up front, uh, I think they're going to, they're going to say, as long as people are in good faith trying to do what the patient asked them to do, I don't think there's any need to get a legal consultation. In point of fact, you know, I, my own personal uh, view is, and this is me personally speaking, is that you don't really want to get into the legal system around these issues unless you really have to, uh, because because uh, you can get you get all kinds of people involved once you get into that system who may not have the patient's best interests involved, may not know the patient at all, and and you really want to try to. And, and the legal system, I don't think, really wants us to get them involved either, and, unless there's a real dilemma, a legal dim a dimension to this. So, so I think they want us to solve these things clinically. I think they want us to have uh, meetings with the main treating clinicians and the family members if the patient can't speak for him or herself. And, and they want us to try to figure out what's the right thing to do to try to honor this patient's 
whatever they said, whatever they said, or whatever documents they completed. And and again, as long as we're doing that in good faith, I think we're on pretty good ground. I'm just going to go and because because I read this recently, Thaddeus's chapter. Um, one of the points that he makes, and it speaks to what you're saying, is that there are some states where um, you can explicitly put in your healthcare directive that you want to stop eating and drinking, and that will be respected. He said there's one state that has that explicit, and that's Nevada. So a Nevada healthcare directive, that will be respected. And then there are several states that absolutely prohibit the use of VSED for people who've lost capacity. Colorado is one, Wisconsin is another. And then there are lots of things in between, which I think what you're talking about, where it's probably legal or it's unclear, the language in the law is, you know, not real clear. And most states fall into that, that, um, that area. But I think that uh, people probably what would like to know that. So I, I think that's something for us, Compassion and Choices, to think more about is, what are the legal standings for this and, and how can we help people know what that is? But, you know, it's, it's explicit in Nevada. They have probably the best law to ensure this in the country. Um, but most people who are suffering from dementia later stages are in long-term care facilities. How do the institutions respond to the said by AD? So after the person has lost capacity and you're, you're wanting to fulfill their advanced directive request, how do those long-term uh, care facilities respond? I would say there's, there's probably some variation. I would say long-term care facilities are very uh, reluctant to be uh, on, in the headlines around subjects like this. Uh, so that they don't want to become a test case, a test institution to do this. Having said that, there are, there are many institutions, long-term care facilities that, that would support this, uh, and, and as long as it was not going to become a big battleground. So they'd re support it on the QT, if you will. If you will. So, and, and I think the, safe, the safest and most common ground would be uh, uh, articulate what I want is only what, what we've called minimal comfort feeding only. Uh, so it's not, it's not enough feeding or drinking to keep yourself going, it's to keep yourself comfortable. So I think if you articulate that you want just the bare minimum, one, if I lose capacity, I only want the bare minimum. And, and I think that's pretty solid in, in nursing, nursing facilities because they're, they're kind of used to minimal, you know, basic comfort feeding only. Now again, institute, but these institutions vary tremendously in how comfortable they are with these kinds of questions, ranging from not in our facility, it's not going to happen, uh, and, and and you'll either have to leave if you want to do this, or um, or we're going to override what you're going to do. Two places that are quite open-minded. So again, if if I were going into uh, a facility or somebody I love was going into a facility uh, with, with dementia early or whatever, this would, be a, this would be something to interview the facility about beforehand. If, they ever if I wanted to have this down the road, I would talk to them up front. Because uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of money at stake uh, for these facilities getting you in there in the first place. They want, they want to have residents. Uh, and if, they, if you can't get what you really want there done, uh, then you probably should try to go someplace else where they're more open-minded, uh, where they're going to be really trying to have you articulate exactly what you want. What you hope they will do is have you articulate as clearly as you can what you would want under these kinds of circumstances, and then figure out how can we implement that. Because, you know, every every notion of care of people who are this sick is to try to keep them in charge as much as you can for the time that they have left. And if you can articulate what that is, then, then that, sets a, that sets a standard, I think, that that's, should be followable by, by at least uh, many institutions. So what, what I read in the book and what I'm hearing you say is that most hospices are comfortable with the concept of minimal comfort feeding only. Does that mean offering food, spoon feeding? What does that actually mean in real practice? Um, it probably, it, again, it, it, it'll depend a little on who's at your bedside. You know, if you're at home with family, uh, it, it can mean 
uh, really just, if, if you've articulated, I want absolutely minimum because I want this to go as fast as possible, then they're gonna give me a little dropper of, of water if I seem to be thirsty. And if, if, and if I still seem to be dry, they'll give me two droppers. Whereas another uh, uh, a place that's less clear is gonna be trying to give you as much fluid as they can to, to not hasten death at all. Because it can, the, the mantra, the usual mantra of hospice is to neither hasten nor postpone. Now again, so I, if you're doing minimal comfort feeding only, is that hastening? Uh, you know, you could have a debate about that, I think. Um, uh, but I, th I think comfort feeding only has a big range you could go with it. And, and most hospices are pretty comfortable with that getting to be a very small amount at the very end of life. The more it's a willful process though, and less a, what might be called a natural process, uh, the more I think you, you go, you'll get some differences of opinion. Before we shift over to questions, we've got tons of questions coming in. I've only been able to glance at a few of them, but I'll shift to taking a look at those. But before I do, I, I thought one of the most interesting parts of your book dealt with the ethics of the challenge that caregivers and family members have responding to the, the now self of the patient who is currently experiencing a dementia versus the then self, which is who they were when they wrote out their advance directive. Can you talk a little bit about what that kind of ethical challenge is? Yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting philosophical uh, challenge, but let, let's say that, um, uh, that then you, let's say you have a certain kind of advanced directive that you've done while you have capacity. That would be the, that's your, that's your wishes right now. And then you lose capacity down the road and you seem to be expressing a different kind of wishes. So that you said, well, if I have dementia, I don't want any feeding at all. And the, that's what the then self said, right? Now the now, now self is saying, I am really freaking thirsty. Give me something to drink. Which one do we listen to? The, the, the then self that said, under no circumstances do I want any fluid to prolong this dying process. And the now self which says, I want fluid now, give it to me now. Why are you not giving it to me? Because I can't, you know, uh, the subtext is I can't remember what, what the then, then self said. So this is, this is a real dilemma. Uh, and, and the more you can articulate your wishes, you know, even you, so you could say in your advanced directive, even if I say that I want fluids uh, down the way, if I'm very confused, don't give them to me. You could articulate that in your advanced directive. Or you could say, give me the, I think the middle ground in this would be for, would be if you hint, were in such a dilemma to do what we, what's been called minimal comfort feeding only. So you, basically you give the minimum amount of fluid. It has nothing to do with adequate hydration and nutrition. It has to do with relieving the discomfort of a dry mouth. And I think that's, that's a way to work through this. Uh, it's a little bit of a middle ground. Um, but I think these are these are not easy uh, uh, situations, and and again, it, it might be a situation where you would get an experienced palliative care person, an ethicist, you know, and a, and a, perhaps the patient's primary care doctor, and have them all sit down with the family and say, "Look, we're trying, we're all trying to do the right thing here, but what do you think she would want us to do?" And you know, the 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 I always go back to the. Uh, uh, I think there was the Qu Quinlan court, you know, which said, you know, if she could wake up right now for five minutes, understand her circumstances completely, and then it had to go back into them, what would she want us to do? That's what the job is. We're trying to figure out what would she want us to do if she could understand all this. And again, it's not always easy to figure that out. But I do think the minimal comfort feeding only is, is uh, probably the backup plan that's the the, the it's not a perfect solution at all, but it's at least a, it's a reasonable solution if you just can't figure it out. And that, and that would um, make the dying process go for months as opposed to weeks or? You know, it, it would, if it was minimal comfort feeding only, so everything else is comfort care, right? Everything else is nothing life prolonging. So all the life prolonging treatments, no antibiotics, no IV fluids, none of those things. 
if you were really sick and you did that, it would probably not go on for months, but it could go on for weeks. It's theoretically possible it could go on for months. I mean, if you were you know, expressing a huge interest in, in drinking uh, and a little bit wasn't doing it, so you expressed another interest, it could go on for a long time, but probably wouldn't that often. Probably it would be just a matter of days to a few weeks. And it's very similar to also uh, standard hospice care, right? We're trying to keep the person comfortable. We're trying to honor their wishes, um, but you know there are there are going there are going to be some tough cases in that circumstance. So I'm switching over to take a look at some of the questions. I think these questions may have come up earlier in the conversation. We may have answered them, but I'm going to circle back just because they may need to be reinforced. But um, there's really a concern and maybe this is misinformation or maybe this is just a, an individual experience that v said can be painful. Um, that the experience of people's organs shutting down, uh, people need morphine at the end. Um, where is that coming from? People are, are hearing that it's painful. What's your experience? Yeah, the, the I don't, I don't, first of all, if you're doing v said you're getting otherwise a hospice plan of care. So the, the whole team should be devoting all of their energies to keeping you as comfortable as possible. So if you're in physical pain, you should be getting morphine or a morphine equivalent in doses until you're not in serious pain. Uh, if you're having bad shortness of breath, you should be getting, uh, uh, again, opioids or other treatments to manage your shortness of breath. And if you're delirious, in an agitated way, you ought to be getting medicines to help you get relaxed. So co aggressive comfort care should be part of this process. So I think, I think the fear that it's gonna be this awful process, uh, that shouldn't be the case if you're uh, getting good palliative care, good hospice care, and people are using all of their skills to keep you as comfortable as possible. The dry mouth is a little tougher. I don't think I don't think it's excruciating, but again, it's not that easy. So swish and swallow, swish and spit. There's techniques to go with that. There's a there's a whole sub literature about how to do this. So you want to get people who are experienced about how to try to relieve this without with while well, keeping the amount that's swallowed to a minimum. Because if you're swallowing a lot and treating that, it's going to prolong the process, and that's not what your goal is. There were a couple of questions about specific diagnoses like Lewy body dementia or ALS. And I assume that it's sort of the same. Um, all the principles are the same. Is there anything specific you would call out about either Lewy body dementia or ALS that would be unique with the v said experience? Well, Lewy, Lewy body dementia, the, that, that will turn on a timing issue. Can you make a decision while you still have capacity to make a decision? I think, I think, and if you, if you lost that window, then you, then you'd be asking for, and probably getting what I, what I call minimal comfort feeding only. So the minimal amount that'll keep you comfortable for the time that you have left, otherwise purely comfort care. Uh, so, so now with ALS is a, is a, is a different uh, ball of wax because in that circumstance, uh, people with most people with ALS still have capacity. They may have some difficulty expressing themselves because they're they're very weak, uh, but uh, but they have capacity. So th the option of stopping eating and drinking is is very open to them. In point of fact, eating and drinking is hard for people with ALS. So many many have a feeding tube uh, because it's so hard to take it, take in enough to keep them going, and they can have the feeding tube while they're still finding it meaningful and, and while they want to have this process prolonged. But when they're ready to die, they can have to, the tube feeding stopped and medicines, comfort medicines can be given through the feeding, uh, through the tube, but not uh, fluids and nutrition. And so that would, that would be a way of stopping eating and drinking that, that you couldn't, you know, you're not eating, drinking by mouth anyway, by and large, but, but this would be a stopping a life-staying therapy, which would be tube feeding. Somebody uh, made a comment. It was more of a comment than a question that um, it seems like this is uh, an option for people who do not have access to medical aid in dying in their states. Um, can you speak to that? And medical aid in dying, just reminding people, is the clinical practice where a patient can ask for and receive a medication 
that they can then self-administer, but they have to be within six months of death and they must have full decision-making capacity. So what would you say about sort of how those two are juxtaposed? Well, they, they also have to live in a state that, that allows it in the in the in the United States. Right. So there's a lot of uh, the majority of the country. It's not legal, uh, or, or it's it's uh, not doesn't have affirmative laws that it will allow it. In a lot of places, it's it's. Uh, sorry. We knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Make it go. real. Keep it real. <laughs> um, so tell me again. What we're where where are we here now? I forgot. I got distracted. There. I got distracted. <laughs> um, uh, oh, V said versus medical aid and dying. Yeah, so v, you know, uh, so V said is an option in places where medical aid and dying is not an option, and some people, by the way, would uh, in places uh, where where medical aid and dying is legally available, uh, would find it unethical to do for themselves uh, for religious reasons or ethical reasons. So they, it's available, it's not for them, but VSAID might be uh, uh, permitted for them. So again, with, with folks who, do, in, none of these options are particularly great, right? These are all options about, about making death come sooner, but there are a, a whole range of last resort options that we should all be aware of, stopping eating and drinking one, you know, VSAT another, stopping life supports another, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and so trying to suit, trying to fit uh, the options to the patient's particular circumstances. And some of those there are their personal values, some of them the status of the law. So again, some folks would say, I, I, I took care of a, uh, a nun who was very ready to die. Now she lived in New York and medical aid and dying would have, wouldn't have been available to her. But if it were, she would never have taken it in a, in a million years because to her, it was unethical. But she was able to stop eating and drinking, which she viewed as a fast for God. She viewed it as a fast. So she was able to make sense out of it in the, in the context of her life and values. And she died a very beautiful death with v -Sed, you know, in her convent, uh, supported by the people around her. And, and uh, so these things can be adapted to circumstances. So we're trying to we're trying to adapt the method to the values and circumstances of each individual patient. Tim, I'm overwhelmed by the number of questions and comments that are coming in so fast. I can't deal with them all, and I'm aware that we're coming toward the end of the hour. Um, and I just wanted to circle back and let you say I know that that there are very specific recommendations that you have for people to help ensure that their advanced directive for stopping eating and drinking is, is followed. Um, what, just to reinforce, what are the things that you think people need to have in their advanced directive to help ensure that they will get uh, access to stopping eating and drinking? Well, I think it, it, first of all, it needs to say, what are the circumstances that you want this activated? So is it, is it a certain level of loss capacity? Is it debility? All the circumstances that need to be met should be very, very clear. So that when, if you are in those circumstances, there's not a lot of debate that you're where you thought you would want this activated. Then, then you need to, in my opinion, you should also identify a surrogate to represent you. Because if you can't represent yourself, you need somebody who uh, is able to answer questions that people might have about your views and values. And again, that means naming somebody and, and it isn't enough just to name somebody and say, you're gonna be it, so uh, good luck. Uh, it's really talking to them, making sure they really know what your views and values are so that when they're faced with the particulars of your circumstance, they can answer, well, she said this or he said that. And then this is exactly what, what he was worried about. And, and so you're really able to speak as if the person was there. So I think those are some of the elements that need to be there. Um, and again, I, and I also think talking to other core family members, so it's not a big surprise to anybody because again, people can come out of the woodwork who, and, and if there is somebody who is really uh, an, not a part of it, a part of this or frightened by all of this that you need to have talked to everybody about it. So-and-so is not gonna find this acceptable, but it's not about him, it's about me. And I want you to really make sure to keep that in mind. This is about me and my values. 
and you can even write that out. You know, I, I know he doesn't agree with this. I'm sorry he doesn't, but it's not about him. This is about me and my values. So those kinds of things should be thought through. Uh, and then talked about within your core people, and then find a clinician who's going to partner with you in this process and, and see it wherever it goes. And again, you, you want to try to do that, not at 1159, if possible, but when you're really thinking about it, you know, it's, it's good chance it's going to be in the future. So who's going to be that clinician who you can count on? And if you can't, if, a, if your clinician is not on board, probably need to get a new clinician at that point, uh, somebody who could support this because they, they, they're yeah. a key ingredient. Yeah, find out in advance. We say that over and over again. Um, I am I'm amazed we're at the end of this hour, but I have a few more pieces of information I wanna share with the audience and they've been asking to get some of this information. So I'm gonna share my screen here again. And um, first I have to remind people that CNC, we are funded almost entirely by individual donors. And if you found this webinar useful, please consider making a donation to support our work. And if you go to the compassionandchoices.org, go slash vsed hyphen donate, that will help us know that it's, this is the information that you find valuable and will help um, us continue to do work on sharing this kind of information with folks. I also wanted to show the book again, um, Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking, a compassionate, widely available option for hastening death from Oxford University Press. You can also find it on Amazon and Google. And if it's sold out, there will be another printing because um, it's extremely valuable book. It really does talk specifically about with dementia, um, how to use this early in dementia, and then how to best prepare to use VSED um, in a later stage of dementia. So I encourage you to, to take a look at that. Um, next week, we have the second in our series of webinars, Finish Strong, Don't Worry, Be Ready. And we're going to be um, talking a little bit more about some of the chapters in the Finish Strong book by our founder, Barbara Coombs Lee. And specifically, we are going to go through the online dementia values and priorities tool that Compassion and Choices has created. It's an addendum to your advanced directive that helps you specifically identify what level of care you might want at various stages as a dementia diagnosis were to progress. So again, there's no charge for this at all. If you want to sign up, uh, to be part of that webinar. It's a week from tonight, same time. Um, go to the compassionatechoices.org webinar, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, website, and go to events, or you could do slash events. And all of our events are listed on there, including this finish strong, don't worry, be ready. Um, Tim, would, can I, parting words from you, sir, because you, you've just, it, this has been such your life's work. And it's just been such an honor to have you give your time this way to talk to folks. Um, thank you for writing the book. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give a, a quick thanks to you and Compassion and Choices for your great advocacy work in this zone and, and in so many other zones. You know, it, it, you're, you're bringing conversation out of the closet and this conversation needs to be out in the open. It's so much safer for patients and families and everybody to have these conversations out and open so people can know their options. And most people, once they know their options can feel much more secure about how the last part of their life is gonna go. So, so I think these, these uh, seminars and webinars really do a, a great service to help people understand uh, a wider range of options so that they can adapt medicine to their particular circumstances as opposed to the other way around. So I'll just say thanks and uh, thanks to everybody for participating. Thanks, everybody. Take a look at our website information there. Uh, this webinar should be up for viewing tomorrow. Uh, thank you all. And if we need, we might have to do this again, Tim, because uh, it's been so well received. And I think people are hungry for this information. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your evening. Good night.